Frontier Fighters. Frontier Fighters, thrilling chapters in the lives of those fearless men and women who fought that civilization might conquer the Old West. Early in the 19th century, there was born a man whose fate it was to bring Oregon into the Union as a territory. But Joseph L. Meek, strangely enough, did not look upon himself as a man of destiny, nor did he give anything more than ordinary importance to the fast accumulating events which began in the year 1843. Those who assembled at Champogue on May 2nd were not trappers who cried more furs, but homemakers who demanded of Oregon an American form of government. Gentlemen! 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 There's a resolution before the House. Are we or are we not to establish a provisional government? Those in favor of the resolution step to the right. I want to be the first to come forward, Mr. The, Chairman. The chair recognizes Joseph L. Meek. Now, who's for divine? All in favor of the report and of an organization, follow me. I'm ready, Joe. Come on over to the American side. Come on, friends. Fifty-two votes will carry it for us. Come on, you Canadians. Come on, you Frenchies. You were with us in 1776. Why not be with us in 1843? The vote as it stands, there are 52 lined up on the left for England. Fifty on the right for the United States. One more man! And we'll have the first American government in the Pacific Coast. One more man! And when I say man, I mean man. There's always been a bond between Canada and the United States. I think now I'd rather be a citizen than a subject. I will give you a majority of one more. Yesterday it was vive la France. Today it's vive la Marie. The vote as it stands is 50 against the American form of government and 52 for it. The American principle of government by self-determination is established. Give me! Yes, listen to that eagle scream! Thus was established the first American government on the Pacific coast at Champogue, Oregon. In 1844, 1,400 immigrants settled in Oregon. This was the year that the cry, 54, 40, or fight, was heard from one end of the United States to the other. And so thrilling was the issue and so excited the nation that it became the campaign slogan for the National Democratic Party. In 1845, 3,000 immigrants came to Oregon. The entire horizon looked rosy for decades to come until the winter of 1847. The legislature was in session when a messenger brought the horrible news. They're all dead, I tell you. Every one of them wiped out by those murderous cayuses. Do you you mean Dr. Mrs. Whitman, Mary Ann Bridger, and my own little girl, Helen Mar Meek, too? Yes, sir, Mr. Meek. There was an uprising of cayuses, and they just wiped out the whole lot of them. Fourteen all told. (laughs) I reckon I should do something, and do it now. But my strength has just slipped away from me. We're all stunned, Joe, every man of us. But something must be done, and done now. Jesse Applegate, 
I appoint you to take a party and seek military aid in California. I accept that charge. Joseph Meek. I've got murder in my heart. Careful what you ask me to do. Joe, I want you and Abbott and a party to set out at once for the nation's capital. The time has come for action. We must go one step further in protecting the citizens of Oregon. We must demand of President Polk that he admit Oregon into the Union. On January 4th, 1848, Joseph Meek and John Ebert set out for Washington, D.C. On their persons were credentials from the government of Oregon, but without a cent for expenses because there was no money in the treasury. They reached Waialatpu in time to attend the last sad rites for the victims of the Indian attack. Although torn by a desire for vengeance, the two men hurried forward over the heavy snows of the Blue Mountains, across the wind-blown deserts of eastern Oregon and western Idaho. Fifteen miles from Fort Hall, Hudson's Bay Post, their horses floundered in the soft snow. If they waited for the weather to clear, the delay might cost Oregon her statehood. If they pushed on without their horses, they were almost certain to be victims of an Indian attack. Well, Joe, what's the word? Horses are plumb tuckered out fighting these drifts. Guess we are too, for that matter. I'm just thinking we could make our way on snowshoes. If we had snowshoes. Uh, I hate to leave the critters. They've got more sense in this wilderness than we have. All right, on we go. Where are you going to get those snowshoes, Joe? Make them. First, I want to get the horses started and in the direction. God will lead them. Get going, you poor dumb critters. Get. Oh, you can't just snap your fingers and pick snowshoes out of the thin air. There's plenty of willow sticks around. Come on, Everett. Get busy. Hey, Joe, I, I ain't never heard of making snowshoes out of willow sticks. Necessity, my friend, is the mother of invention. You'll get willow sticks from willow tree. I ain't never before been licked by any situation that takes a mighty reasoning. And this ain't going to be the first time. Gosh, old thunder. These willow stick snowshoes ain't half bad. John, look. The engines, a whole file of them. Praise be we're making a track light. Just a blanket and rifle apiece. They get wind of us. We're, we're goners. Mm. We don't find something to eat, too, we're goners. There's a third day without food. They've sighted us. Too late to run now, John. We'll have to fight it out. They're trying to get as close as they can on the horses. I got a score to settle with them, Kaisers. And I don't intend to waste any bullets. Don't shoot yet, Joe. If I get the chief, maybe the others will turn tail and run. Got him. And here's another for what looks like the chief's son. They got him. Dog gone, Joe. Two shots and the whole band of Cayuses turned tail and run. It was more than bullets they felt, Everett. It was my hate. <laughs> Every moment now, Meek was getting closer to Washington, D.C. Finally, at St. Louis, he met Robert Campbell, an old mountain friend. And when the story was told to the newspapers, Meek found he had become famous in a single night. But fame did not provide him with passage money on the steamboat declaration, nor her rival also tied to the wharf. Oh, I sure wish I had the money to get you and Robert passage on the declaration. You don't have to look out none for me, Mr. Campbell. I got kin folks here in St. Louis. I'm on the last leg of my trip, and I'm not going to give up now. This boat goes from St. Louis to Wheeling, West Virginia. The stage takes me from Wheeling to Washington. Goodbye, Campbell. So you ain't got no money for a ticket. No, but I've got an idea. Excuse me, sir. Pardon me, madam. I'm in a great hurry. I wonder who that strange creature is in the wolfskin cap. Well, looks like he's from the far west. Maybe some trapper. Are you the captain of the declaration? I am, sir. Whom have I the pleasure of addressing? Joseph L. Meek from Shampoo, Oregon. Howdy. Captain, I notice you have a rival in that steamer also tied in this wharf. Is that tub a rival of the declaration? <laughs> I notice that this tub, as you call her, is getting passengers aboard, and you're not. Uh-huh. On a full passenger list to Wheeling? And by what miracle do you expect to get it for me? If I do, promise me my ticket and my meals? Well, well, granted. But don't you think you'd better go below decks and get a little of that uh, stain of travel off of you? <laughs> Not yet, Captain. The stain of travel 
Dirt, we call it in Oregon, is part of my plan. All right, Captain, here goes. This way, gentlemen, if you please. This way. Come right aboard the Declaration. I just come across the plains two miles from the Columbia River, where the Indians are killing your missionaries. Those passengers who come aboard the Declaration will hear all about it before they get fit for it. Before these people book passage, may I see your credentials meet? Here they are, Captain. And we're extraordinary and minister plenipotentiary from the Republic of Oregon to the court of the United States. Come on, folks, don't lose a minute. The declaration is the best vote that ever carried a man with a mission as important as mine. <laughs> You're a smart one, Mr. Meek. <laughs> That's one trick I never thought of. Trick a dog's hind foot. That's Yankee ingenuity. Come on, folks, fill her up. All I've got to do is to make your hair stand right up. Yes, sir. Come on. It was just a little over two months from the day that Joe Meek started out from Oregon that he was ushered into the White House with considerable pomp and ceremony. First person to receive him was not the president, but Mrs. Polk. Uh, Madam President, uh, I ain't no fit condition to be seen by a fine lady like you. Everything here in the White House is so uh, handsome. And your dress, ma'am. Well, don't let the rustle of my silk dress frighten you, Mr. Meek. My, my. A hero frightened by the trappings of civilization. Out in Oregon, we, we just got things plain. Then, too, ma'am, <laughs> I ain't shaved in over two months. Nor have I had a minute to get a change of clothes. Nor the money to get any if you wished for them. Bless you for your courage and sacrifices. From the moment I knew of your arrival, I told the president... If all the good people in Oregon are like you, their territory is indeed deserving of everything... The president will see Mr. Joseph L. Meek of Oregon. Uh, you were just about to say, Madam President, that... Oh, uh... Well, I'm sure the president will wish to say that himself, Mr. Meek. God bless you and yours. Thank you, madam. The messenger from Oregon, Mr. President. Mr. President, God grants a good health. I've been more than two months out from Oregon to say, sir... That you should as quickly as possible urge a bill before the Congress to organize Oregon as a territory. Joseph Meek, the President of the United States will not alone urge such a bill before the Congress of the United States, but fight for its passage. But, sir, uh, I haven't told you anything about myself or Oregon. You have been in Washington for 24 hours, and the entire capital is alive with your zeal, your enthusiasm, your love for that land which you now call home. My hand, sir. Mr. President. Alone, we may lose this fight for Oregon, but altogether, we cannot fail. On August 13th, 1848, after one of the most bitter fights ever experienced in the Congress, the bill asking Oregon's admittance into the Union became a law. Joseph Lane of Indiana was appointed Oregon's first governor, and Joseph L. Meek, United States Marshal of the New Territory. And so ends another glorious epoch in our history, thrilling moments from the life of Joseph L. Meek, the happy warrior of the Old West, another frontier fighter. <laughs> 